this is a space for birds. It could be any time of the year. It doesn't have to be Christmas. Birds don't celebrate Christmas. They don't know. Welcome to Crafting with the Dean. This is Dean Stephen Tepper. No, Craft with the Dean. Okay, we're going to do this again. Welcome to Crafts with the Dean. This is Dean Stephen Tepper, and I'm here with Courtney Davis, um, a graduate student in a design school studying interior architecture. That's correct. Um, and uh, the most outstanding graduate of the design school this year. I'll be proud to announce that at convocation. Um, but, uh, uh, but we're actually going to try and prove how outstanding she is with this very complex crafting project that involves extraordinary design sensibilities. We will be painting birdhouses. So you ready? Totally ready. Okay, birdhouses. Birdhouses. Um, so uh, just you know, a little way this works. Um, some questions will seem relevant to what we're doing. Some will be relevant to you. And some questions will be completely irrelevant. So we're going to start with that. Okay. The irrelevant questions. Good. Which is, um, so birds. I actually have a huge, um, I have a bird phobia. A bird phobia? Yeah, mostly related to wild birds like pigeons. Um, okay, so now we'll go, now we're going to move into therapy <laughs> to understand a little bit about what might lie at the heart of your bird phobia. Is this, um, wasn't from watching a uh, Hitchcock film. No, no. Although I have seen that, but that didn't, when I watched that, it didn't bother me. No, this is related to um, an incident in my home where a bird got in the house and flew all around my bedroom and made a mess. Made a really big mess. Um, and did you try and catch it with like a towel or a net? I did not try to catch it. I ran upstairs because this was this was in the top floor of my house, and I, I ran up there because I heard some weird noises and the bird was flopping around. So I just opened a window that I knew did not have a screen, and then I went back downstairs. And you just hope for let the best. it sort of work. Is so that kind of a, a philosophy for problem solving for you? Just. <laughs> open a window and help hope that things will work out is that i mean is it does that sound good i'm trying to decide if that sounds good or bad well i it, mean it maybe it might be a good maybe it's sort of a more passive strategy for sure so uh design you weren't always a what were you doing before you came to graduate school i was first i, I graduated um my undergraduate degree is in theater Okay. So I was an actor and I did some costume design. I have a theater company that I actually still work with. Um, I do costume design and, and some sort of conceptual design for the theater. And then and I became a mom and I have two kids. So that's a design project? That is. There's a uh, lot of systems. There's uh, a lot uh, of design holding that, uh, holding that together. Okay, so design. It uh, feels like 20 years ago, no one talked about design. We know we had designers. There were um, architects and interior designers and graphic designers and industrial designers, but we, we didn't talk about design. Right. It seems like there's been this renaissance of design. Everybody wants design. Every you know, business school wants design thinking. Engineering wants design thinking. Um, companies are hiring design um, designers uh, to, to do more than just uh, design products or or, or images. Um, so, what, what is this renaissance of design? What's going on, and why? Uh, why is it? Why should we pay attention to it? I don't know why it's necessarily come to the forefront more. Maybe people are just talking about it differently. I mean, obviously, everything, everything there is, everything has been designed, and that's been that way. Do you forever. think people um, recognize that? How how conscious are people of? of their designed environment. Really good design is almost imperceptible. Um, and that's kind of the point because you're not you're not noticing what's going wrong or you're not noticing, oh, this is really clunky and hard to, you know, hang in the tree or whatever. Right. Um, like I, I actually don't know how we're going to hang this in, in the tree. Because there's no hook? There's, and there's feet. Interesting. So, well, maybe it, it's an it interesting birdhouse design. I guess it is a, a table birdhouse. Can't believe you're done. Oh, I'm not done. I've just oh, okay. I've created a a uh, a base of uh, uh -huh. of color, and now I'm gonna I'm trying to figure out. I think I want to draw a bird on the birdhouse, which is interesting because that would be like drawing a person on the 
inside of a regular house, which I guess we do. We've got a mural art. A mural. We often think about you know interior architecture working with really wealthy people, right? Who have resources to build exactly the spaces that they can dream about right. and see in magazines. But you've worked with a lot of different kinds of clients, if you will, um, who are not wealthy, who have whose spaces have a social purpose. So tell, can you tell us about one of those projects and sure. how, you, how you might approach that differently as a designer? Um, I worked on a project um, with Design and Arts Corps where I partnered with Chrysalis Shelter, which is um, a shelter for survivors of domestic abuse. And this was a space that when you walked in, it truly felt it felt broken. There were there were actual broken things in the space, and I worked mostly with the shelter. I did get to meet the family that I eventually moved in, but um, the shelter was working on getting their trauma informed care certification. Okay. So um, trauma informed care basically has a set of design principles that go along with it. So I spent a lot of time researching those design What's principles. What's an example of a design principle for trauma informed care? Um, I feel like window treatments are a really good example. So. Um, when we went into the space, there were a lot of blankets just sort of tacked over the windows. Um, and at first I thought, oh, it's Arizona, it's hot, they must not have, you know, really great windows that are keeping that heat out. Um, and then also just an issue of, of budget, like there wasn't, there wasn't really the money to go out and buy something nice. But when we talked about it more, and when I looked into trauma-informed care, window coverings really affect how we feel. We, they, they affect our security, they affect how much light we are letting into the space. So. Um, if a person is in a healing process where they're just not comfortable being exposed to the being exposed, these are people who have you know experienced violence in their own homes. They want to sort of protect themselves by feel a little bit more nested. Exactly. So your first instinct would be, oh, let's brighten this up. Yeah, like let's have some white flowy curtains or something. You know, something that feels really soft and and gentle. But really, we had to come up with a really practical solution. So it could really close if if the client really needed like, no, I need to just shut the world out, that could happen. Um, and, but it didn't always feel like right. well, a that's, cave. That's incredibly, uh, I mean, just to think about that complexity, right? I mean, it's a great example yeah. of where a common assumption about a space uh, you know, might be very different if you're taking into account the specific needs of a community, especially one that's gone through trauma. Right. All right, so uh, I would like your feedback. I have decorated the structure and um, I guess what I was I was thinking uh, I have the um, uh, green and red are uh -huh. complementary con con colors is that correct yeah they're across the color wheel right yep. across that I think that would be a great title for like a short story across the color wheel yeah think about that and about like a, a romance between people who, are, who were perceived to be incompatible but uh -huh. actually uh, they needed each other, so that's that's across the color wheel. We'll work on that script. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, and you, because you're a theater person, you yeah. can help me with that. I thought the details were kind of fun. Yeah, just I think this that's... little guy, this little inset. It's kind I of love a fun little inset. reveal. You can yeah. imagine that maybe the whole inside is orange, or yeah, that's fantastic. You know, maybe not. So. Um, okay, so I, I now I see an opportunity. I don't yeah. Want, um, you know, the greatest designers are uh, are, are are great imitators. So. Well, thank you for, for joining. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, we've got a, a, one of our best uh, uh, graduating students who uh, has just shown you through this particular design detail how brilliant they are. So this little, right, this little um, suggestion that the whole house might in fact be orange. Um, this is like a good thing to think about because uh, even when you don't have the resources to do everything you want to do, if you could just figure out analogically, metaphorically, like what's that little design feature that you can convince people perhaps there's more there than meets the eye. Um, that is also a big fortune cookie message. Um, so, uh, so thanks, Crafting with the Dean. We did it. Congratulations. We did it. When did you start that fist bump? <laughs> I don't know. Have we done that now a couple times in a row? Should we like pull it back? You guys could like pull, you could do reverse fist bump. I mean, I just... Exploding.